Well, beloved brothers and sisters, we will say once again, Shalom to everyone. God bless you. Uh, and I would like you all please to open your Bibles uh, this uh, uh, Shabbat uh, message for this Shabbat message. Please open this time. We are going to look back to the Psalms, to the Tanakh, and we are going to look into Psalm 2, the second Psalm. Uh, previously, we shared a, a message from Psalm uh, 1, but it is fascinating, beloved brothers and sisters, how the Psalms, in Hebrew we call it uh, Tehillim, uh, and especially it's like a song, it's a mizmor. It is a mizmor, it is a song, it is a praise in which... Uh, uh, our forefathers, the Jewish people, were using this whole uh, book of Psalm, Tehillim, in order to praise God and to uh, address Him from the bottom of their hearts, even when they were sometime under sadness and pain and sorrow, another time when they were uh, under joyful circumstance. And this uh, uh, book of Psalms, uh, Tehillim, is a wonderful a book that reminds us of the necessity to praise God. Of course, we are today as believers in Yeshua, uh, Jesus the Messiah, we live in this present day of the assembly, of the church, of the uh, congregation, of the Kehillah. We live in a unique period of time. The Messiah has come, Yeshua, he died, he was buried, and he rose again uh, for our justification, and he is seated at God's right hand, awaiting the day that he will return, he will come back, he will, first of all, will take the heavenly company, the church to be with him, but he will come to rule and to reign over Israel, the nation, and over all the nations of the world in the future day. And this is wonderful truth to learn, but we as believers today can uh, still read these Psalms and see how much God loves us, loves the Mashiach, the Messiah Yeshua, but also how much God knows the need of humanity and that all men by nature have sinned and come short of the glory of God and God made provision for mankind uh, through the Mashiach Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, whom he sent to this world. Let me read this psalm. Psalm 2, the second psalm, Mizmor le David. It is a psalm that was written by David. We know it from the Brit Hadasha, from the New Covenant. And listen to this very, very interesting psalm. I hope you have your Bibles with you. To open the Bible is very important because we want to make sure that what we proclaim is indeed written in the Word of God. And each and every one of us should uh, 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 learn from the Word of God as we open uh, the Scripture and read the Word of God. And so we read in the second Psalm. It began with the question, why? Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Jehovah against the Lord and against his Mashiach, his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord ha shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his anger, in his wrath, and vax them in his soul displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare a decree. The Lord have said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod, of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear 
and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. This last statement in Hebrew, Ashrei kol chosei bo. In other words, blessed are all they that put the trust in the Mashiach, in the Messiah, in the Son of God. <coughs> now, beloved brothers and sisters, as we are reading this text, we are learning very quickly here in this uh, second psalm that uh, there are many voices that are mentioned here in this psalm. You will notice that you have actually four voices that are found here in this psalm. The first voice is the voice of the nations, verses 1, 2, and 3. The second voice is the voice of God the Father, Elohim Ha'aba, verses 4, 5, and 6. The third voice is the voice of God the Son, verses 7, 8, and 9, Elohim Ha'ben. And fourthly, the fourth voice is the voice of God the Holy Spirit, Elohim Ha'ruach, in verses 10, 11, and 12. We have four voices that are mentioned here in the second psalm, and it is no wonder that the second psalm is following immediately after the first psalm, not only because it is number one and number two, it is simply because in Psalm 1 we have learned about the wonderful, the blessed man, the Messiah Yeshua himself, who lived a life for God and who was the one that gave delight to God because God said of him twice in Matthew 3 and Matthew 17, this is my beloved son. But then sadly, in contrast to God's son, we have the world, the whole human race, that have gone astray. No wonder the apostle Shaul Paul said in Romans 3 verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The apostle Shaul Paul is quoting what David, the king of Israel, said in Psalm 14 and in Psalm 53, there is not one man that is just upon the face of this earth. And that all have gone astray. And that's including you and I, beloved brothers and sisters, and it is only the grace of God that touch your heart and touch your mind and mind that open our eyes to see that we are sinners by nature and we need the grace of God. We need God's forgiveness in our life. And so in the second psalm, we see the beginning of the psalm, the voice and the opinion of the human race because of the sin nature against Jehovah and against his Mashiach against his anointed one. And you notice what we read in verse 1? The question is being asked, why? Notice that how the psalm begins? In verse 1, why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. Verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Listen to this, beloved brothers and sisters. It is against the Lord. And it is against his anointed saying. That word for anointed comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach. The word here is Meshicho, means the anointed one of the Lord, of Jehovah. And the question is, of course, why is it? Why is it that the whole world, notice this, verse 1, the heathen, Verse 1b, the people. Verse 2a, the kings. And verse 2b, the rulers. You notice that four Hebrew words. The heathen is the goyim, the Gentile world. 
The people is Leumim, the nations of the world. The kings of the earth, Malchei Aritz, and the rulers, these are Roznim, four different Hebrew words which include all the human race. The Gentile world, the Jewish world, the kings of the earth, the rulers of this earth, everyone have gathered together. Notice that it says here in verse 2, they gather together, they counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed one, the Mashiach. This is so fascinating. This is something that we all need to learn in our lives, that by nature, beloved brothers and sisters, even though we don't like to hear that, but by nature we all have sinned. We have all come short of the glory of God. In fact, if you have your Bible with you, turn to John chapter 3 and verse 19, and you notice what Yeshua the Messiah said concerning humanity. John chapter 3 and verse 19, there we read, listen to this very interesting verse, beloved brothers and sisters. John 3 and verse 19, he says, and, and this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men, listen to this, men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Men love darkness rather than light. Now, nobody likes that someone will say this to him or will say this to her, but the reality before the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, the God of the universe, before the living God, all of us, we God knows the heart of a man that men love darkness rather than light. No wonder. Go back to Genesis for a moment, in chapter 6, and look what we read in Genesis chapter 6, right in the beginning of the of that chapter, specifically in verse 5. In Genesis chapter 6, and verse 5, we read, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in all the earth, or in the earth, and that every, listen to this, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart he was evil continuously. Every imagination, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. The Hebrew word continue means all the day, kol hayom. This is the human race and no wonder Psalm 2 began. Why do the heathen rage? Why do the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers they counseled together against the Lord and against his anointed. And you notice what they're saying? I'm back in Psalm 2 and verse 3. What do they say? Listen to what the heathen, the people, the kings, the rulers say in verse 3. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. In other words, the world, this is the voice of the world, is really saying, we don't want God in our life. We don't want his anointed one, the Mashiach, the Messiah, Yeshua in our life. We don't want God's boundaries in our life. We want to carry on in our own way. We want to do our own thing. And because God is holy and righteous, he set boundaries here in this world. He gave us the Torah, the law. He gave us his commandments, the mitzvot. He gave us his word, the scripture. He gave us a guideline. Initially, he gave it to the nation of Israel. And through the nation of Israel, he gave it to the world today. Both the Tanakh and the Brit HaChadashah, the Hebrew scriptures and a new covenant. God gave us his word in order to guide us. And you and I know very well, we live in a lawless world, including the human nature that exists in us. We are no different than the others. The Lord saved us and forgave our sins. But the point is that man by nature is saying within themselves, God, 
I don't want to have anything to do with you. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now, what are these bands and what are these cords? You see, when God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, and then through Adam and Eve, he brought into this world all humanity, God set boundaries for our own blessing because he knew that we are human beings. If we are left to ourselves, we will carry on lawless life because our hearts is deceitful. And because our, our, our nature is sinful, we are going on in our own way. And that's why God wants us to be blessed and he protects us and he put boundaries. Just for, for an illustration, can you imagine if there will be no signs on the road, stop sign or yield sign, or maybe the limit in the in the uh, how 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 fast can we drive? Can you imagine if everybody everyone will just simply carry on and have no when there needs to stop he will not stop, and when there is need to yield he will not yield or she, and when there is a need to drive in a certain speed limit he or she will not. Can you imagine if everything will be in a careless way? I remember many years ago I was traveling overseas. And when I was traveling in a certain in that particular city, there was no stop signs. There was no yields. And every time when you come into an intersection, you hope to God that nobody else is coming from any other side and they will come right through and get and an accident will happen. So automatically in my mind, coming from Yerushalayim, Israel, and, and Canada, and automatically I'm, you know, I I I'm cautious a little bit uh, less the, uh, someone will drive. And then people behind you toot the horn because they said there is no stop sign. Why are you stopping or why are you yielding? Can you imagine what will happen? Can you imagine when every man will do that which is right in his own eyes? In the book of Judges, in the history of our people Israel, the judges in those days, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So God in his wisdom and his grace have set boundaries to protect his people, to protect humanity. But you see, the world, because of its sinful nature, says, God, we don't want your bends. We don't want your cords. We don't want your boundaries. We want to carry on in our own way, and that is the way whereby things have been since the beginning, since the fall of Adam. Up till today, beloved brothers and sisters, the world in which we live in saying to God, God, we do not want you in our lives. And it is only by the grace of God that he opened the hearts of some to turn to him, to realize that we needed him, we needed forgiveness of sins, and to accept the Mashiach Yeshua. Well, listen, let's follow in this passage, because it is very interesting. Well, this is the voice of the world. The voice of the world, the, world, the voice of the nation is against God, and you notice also against his anointed one, the Mashiach. And remember, beloved brothers and sisters, the reason that the Mashiach came, he came to provide redemption for sinners. The Messiah Yeshua came at his first coming, and he's the one of whom we read in the New Covenant so much concerning his the birth of the Messiah, the life of the Messiah, the death of the Messiah, the burial of the Messiah, the resurrection of the Messiah, all what you have done for us. In fact, if you turn with me to Romans chapter 4, and in Romans chapter 4, we see the reason and what the Messiah have accomplished for us. Romans 4 and verse 25, He was delivered for our offenses but he was raised for our justification. Yeshua the Messiah was delivered by God unto death, 
for our offenses, for our sins. But he was raised in order to give us justification if we have only believed on him and trusted him in what he has done for us. So back to Psalm 2. Now in the second voice in Psalm 2, we now hear the voice of God the Father. And here we learn of the triunity of the Godhead mentioned or seen very clearly in the next verses from verse 4 to verse 12. First of all, we see the voice of God the Father. And listen, what God the Father, Elohim Ha'aba, what he has to say about his beloved anointed one, the Mashiach, the Messiah. We read him in verse, and I'm reading verses 4, 5, and 6. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vax them in his sore displeasure. And then verse 6, we hear what he has to say. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. This is so beautiful when you really think about it, beloved brothers and sisters. While man by nature has a negative opinion against God and against God's anointed one, the Mashiach, God himself, this is God the Father here, as far as he's concerned, he has a plan for his anointed one. You see, we read in verse 4 that he that sitteth in the heaven. Who is the one that sits in the heaven? The one that sits in the heaven is none else but Jehovah God himself. If you just turn the pages to chapter 11, Psalm 11, Yes, in your page, in your, in your Bible, Psalm 11. And there, listen what we read in verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. God is in heaven. He's seeing everything that is going on in this world. His eyes, according to Psalm 11 and verse 4, His eyes behold, His eyelids try the children of men. Beloved brothers and sisters, we see here in this verse uh, 4 that the Lord is in heaven. Go to Psalm 103 and there listen to these verses there. Psalm 103 and there we read, Concerning the Lord being in heaven, we do read in verse 19, The Lord has prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. In other words, the Lord himself, God the Father, is ruling over the affairs of this world. With his eyes he can see all things, and he's observing to see how and what man has to say about the anointed one, the Mashiach. And you notice again, I'm back in our psalm, Psalm 2. He says in verse uh, uh, 4, He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. This is the laughter of mockery against men. And secondly, the Lord have, shall have them in derision. This is that God will be scorning men. People will reject him. People will reject the Mashiach, the Messiah. Well, in response to this, God who is in the heavens, the creator of the universe, is looking down upon humanity, knowing the condition of man, knowing the sinfulness of man. He is really, he is, as it says here, in scorning. He is going to tell humanity what he is planning to do for the one that they have rejected. And so, beloved brothers and sisters, you can see that while God's Son, the Messiah, came to this world, He was rejected now for the last 2,000 years by the vast majority of this world. But already David, already the Lord have knew this long before the Messiah came, when David was, the psalmist of, of Israel was 
uh, uh, presenting this psalm, singing this psalm, guided by the Holy Spirit of God. And he's saying now in verses 6 and 7, concerning the voice of God the Father, what will he say? Notice in verse 5, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. You see, God is not pleased with the way men live when men live away from him. It, is, it doesn't give God pleasure. Sin separates between a holy God and a righteous a, a, and an unrighteous man and a sinful man. A holy and a righteous God cannot look upon sin. And so we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and they brought a distance. And that's why the Messiah had to be sent. And so God is looking down in his wrath, and he will and vax them in his soul dis displeasure and listen to what he's saying to humanity, to you and I, to the whole world. You do not want my Messiah, my Mashiach? Listen in verse 6, he says, Yet, as far as I am concerned, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, of Zion. In other words, God the Father says, you see, while the world is speaking against the Lord and against his Mashiach, yet as far as God is concerned, he have already set his uh, king upon his holy hill of Zion. Now notice that that Messiah is now presented before us as a king. You see, the lesson is tremendous, beloved brothers and sisters. The same Yeshua, who is now despised and rejected of men, is actually a king that will rule over this world. You remember how the Gospel of Matthew began in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 2 when the wise men came from the east? And you remember what they said in uh, uh, Matthew 2 and verse 2, where is he that was born the king of the Jews? He is the king. He is the king of Israel. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And you see, beloved brothers and sisters, he is now despised and rejected. But as far as God is concerned, he have already set his king upon his holy hill of Zion. And you know what we learn from this? Is we learn, we learn that because God is sovereign and because he's ruling, his, his providence is over all the affairs of this world, he looks over the ages. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the beginning from the end. You and I live here by the short time. But God from heaven looking down, he knows the ages. He knows the days when he called Abraham. He knows the days when he gave the Torah to Israel. He knows the days when the Messiah came and died. He knows the day when the church was born. He knows everything and he's looking all the way to the future days. And he's saying, yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. You notice the three times the word I, my and my holy hill. God is sovereign. It is he, the, the one who will set a king in his place. It is he is the one that has chosen the Mashiach, the Messiah Yeshua to be his king. It is he, the one that will, that, that the holy hill of Zion belong to him, belongs to God. And he's saying this to the world. He's saying, okay, you reject him. But as far as I'm concerned, he is my king, and I've already set him upon my holy hill of Zion. Now, we know very well that that king is the Messiah, Jesus himself. And Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, at his first coming, was rejected. So obviously, he's not sitting in his holy hill of Zion in the city of Jerusalem today. No, of course not. We live in the period of time of his rejection. Every one of us who belong to him today know it very well. If you have trusted in him, 
If you accepted him as your Mashiach, Lord and Savior, you and I belong to him. But the vast majority of the world still reject him. He is not ruling in Jerusalem yet. In fact, the world carry on in its own way. Conflicts and wars and animosities, nations are rising against nations. These all sort of diseases, viruses, infections and problems here in this world. Because we live in a world that is judged by God. But one day the Messiah will come and he will be sitting upon God's holy hill of Yerushalayim. Israel as a nation will be restored. The church will rule and reign with him as well. The world will receive a blessing. This is still waiting. The Messianic kingdom. Malchut HaMashiach, the future day. But until then, praise God, you and I, and many others in the world have accepted Yeshua as our Lord and Savior. But still the whole world, the vast majority of the world saying, like in verse 3, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. We will not have this man to rule over us. Rejection of the Messiahship of Yeshua is still existing today. And so, beloved brothers and sisters, we heard about the voice of humanity, all men, verses 1, 2, and 3. We also heard the voice of God the Father who said, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. This is Elohim Ha'aba, God the Father. But now if we move along here in this interesting psalm, in the next verses, verses 7 and 8, and nine, we listen to the voice of God, the Son, the Mashiach himself, the Messiah himself. And notice what the Messiah, Yeshua, has to say. He does say in verses 7, 8, and 9, and let me read it for you together, I will declare a decree. The Lord had said unto me, Thou art my Son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. You notice, beloved brothers and sisters, that immediately the, the voice have changed. Now we learn that in verses... <clears throat> 7, 8, and 9, that this is the voice of the Mashiach, the Anointed One, God the Son, as man. When he entered humanity, he took union, human nature with his divine nature, he became a man by the name of Yeshua, who was born to the, to the virgin Miriam in the city of Bethlehem, to the Jewish people, to the, according to the Hebrew scripture. And here we see that he is now responding to that which his father said. And now he is declaring, I will declare a decree. Notice that verse 7, I will declare a decree. The Lord, this is Jehovah, he has said unto me, this is the Mashiach, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. In other words, now Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, is presented here as that son. And what does he do? He's declaring to all what he was told by his Abba, by his father. Notice his father said to him, Thou art my son. You know, we as Jewish people have a lot of problem to understand the triunity of the Godhead. If you'll ask any one of our rabbis, do you believe in the triunity of the Godhead? Do you believe that God has a son? Well, for, the, for us, for our spiritual leaders in, in Israel and around the world, this is mind-boggling. How is it possible? How can you even dare to claim that God has a son? We have one God. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We don't have three gods. 
This is the pagan world, the Gentile world. They will say, but of course, we who believe in Yeshua the Messiah don't have three gods. We believe in one single God who exists and consists in three persons. Ha'aba, ha'ben, ha'uach, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Here we find out that the Lord says to the Anointed One, Thou art my Son. Atabni, or bni ata. This day have I begotten thee. That expression, this day have I begotten thee, is not only an expression that speaks about the Messiah's incarnation when he became a man, but also in his incarnation and resurrection. In other words, Yeshua the Messiah is always the eternal Son, but he now became also Son in his humanity and in his birth and his in his resurrection. If you just turn with me to Isaiah, uh, chapter 9 and we see this very clearly in Isaiah chapter 9 and I just I may have mentioned it before but I think I should mention it once again in Isaiah chapter uh, 9 and verse 6 which has a reference to the person of the Lord Jesus the Messiah we read in verse 6 and to us a child is born this is his humanity <coughs> And then verse 6b, and to us a son is given. This is his divinity. As his son, he was never born because he always was the eternal son. But as a child, he was born into this world. And to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government should be upon his shoulder, and his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is the Mashiach, the eternal son who became a man and he was born to the virgin Miriam as a child he was born, but as a son he was always the eternal son. But here we learn in Psalm 2 and verse 7 that he not only was a son in his divine nature, but when he entered into this world, beloved brothers and sisters, this is doctrine, this is teaching. He also became a son in his incarnation and in his resurrection. Now turn with me to Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, the apostle Shaul Paul emphasize this when he's speaking about the resurrection of the Messiah. And he's quoting this very same psalm in Acts chapter 13 and a few verses there. Listen to what we read in Acts chapter 13 and the verses are found specifically verse 33. But uh, let me read verse uh, uh, 32. And we declare unto you the glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers. God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he had raised up Yeshua again, as it is written. And what does he quote? Psalm 2 and verse 7. As it is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. You see, Shaul Paul read Psalm 2. And he's preaching the resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah from the dead. And he's quoting Psalm 2 and verse 7 that God had raised the Messiah, and he called him his son. He is the eternal son, but he is also a son in incarnation and in resurrection. He became the, the son of God. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, we read in Matthew chapter 3. And so now quickly, let's just draw down to the end of this chapter. Because in the next verses, we find out 
In verse 8 and 9, what the son says that God the Father said to him, Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. In other words, that takes us all the way, beloved brothers and sisters, to the second coming of the Mashiach. When Yeshua, Jesus, is going to come in his second coming, he will be the one who will ultimately judge this world in righteousness. You and I are so blessed to belong to him today. The judgment has passed over us because Yeshua died on the cross, on the tree, and his punishment was a, he, he was punished because of me, because of us, because of every believer. But there is a day coming in which we can read in so many passages at his second coming when he will judge this world in righteousness. Just quickly, turn to Revelation chapter 19. Just to, to read this verse uh, before, uh, to, so it will be before. Revelation chapter 19, uh, specifically noted verses, uh, verse 15. It says, And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and that he should smite the nation, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Quoting Psalm 2. This is the second coming of the Messiah. He will rule them with a rod of iron, and as he and he will tread them, as um, as it says here, tr- as he uh, he treads the winepress of the fierceness of his wrath, the wrath of the Almighty God, and he shall have on his vesture and on his thigh the name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. The Messiah is coming again, and he will receive all that which God had promised unto him, beloved uh, brothers and sisters. So the voice of God the Son, the voice of Yeshua the Messiah, is simply this. God said to him that he will be his easy son, and that ultimately he will be the one that will tread, will judge this world in righteousness at his second coming. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, just quickly in closing, so we don't leave this psalm without to finish it, the final verses are very beautiful. Because the last verses, verse 10, 10, 11, and 12, is the voice of the Holy Spirit of God, Elohim HaRuach. See, the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God is to appeal, is to convict, is to awaken souls that people will realize I need God in my life. I need to accept Yeshua the Messiah. If I will not accept him, I will judge, I will be judged, and I will die in my sins. But if I will, I will receive forgiveness of sins, and I will be eternally with God. Eternally with Yeshua, with Jesus the Messiah. And so listen to the voice of warning that the Spirit of God, God the Holy Spirit, gives here in the psalmist, David, tells us this prophetically. And so we, we read, listen, and I'm reading just these verses for all of us. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the Son, lest he be angry and he perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Ashrei kol chosei bo. In the last verse of Psalm 2. So what is the invitation? The Holy Spirit of God up till today is ministering And as we share the message of the gospel of the grace of God, the Holy Spirit of God convicting hearts, using the the message of the gospel to bring people to a relationship with God and saying to all, kiss, listen to this, verse 12, kiss the son. This is a kiss of affection and love. <clears throat> to love the Son, the very same Son, 
that here is presented before us as the one as the one that is rejected and despised by men, kiss the son. Why should men kiss the son and, and acknowledge him, a kiss of love and affection, a kiss of acceptance? Why? Because his righteous indignation against sin will come. Lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. A wise man, a wise woman, verse 10, be wise, kings, be instructed, judges. If you are wise, you will serve the Lord, verse 11. If you are wise, you will fear the Lord. If you are wise, you will rejoice with reverence. If you are wise, you will kiss the Son will kiss the Mashiach, the Messiah, who loved us and gave himself for us. You see, a wise man find him. A wise woman find him. A wise man and women who found him will kiss him and will serve him and will live for him. Because to live for the Lord here in this world is worthwhile. One day the Lord will have to come, and those who rejected him will have to suffer the consequence. But those who believe on him, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Spirit of God, give us a reason to live for him, to serve him, and ultimately to wait the day when he will come to take us to be with him in glory. And I pray and I trust that all of us, belong to the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, and we kissed the Son. We have acknowledged that He is the one that gave Himself for us. So may the Lord bless His word. And can we say amen to this? You are muted. You can still say amen. 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 God bless you, brother. Amen. God bless you. <laughs> Very good. Well, let's do this in closing, beloved brothers and sisters. May the Lord bless his word. Let's just pray together. We will say Shabbat Shalom to each other after the benediction. And until the next meeting uh, in the will of the Lord, uh, the Lord will tarry. We'll see each other once again uh, over, this, uh, um, over the, this channel. Well, let's just pray and then have the benediction and say Shabbat Shalom. My God and our Father, thank you so much. For Yeshua, Jesus, our Lord and our Messiah, who loved us, gave himself for us. Thank you for the second psalm that reminds us of the voices of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Oh, we thank you, Abba Father, for your precious, precious word. Bless the rest of the day, we pray, as we ask it in Yeshua's name. And beloved brothers and sisters, receive the benediction. Yevachecha Adonai v'yishmerecha, Ya'er Adonai pana v'lecha v'yichunecha, Yisa Adonai pana v'lecha v'yasem lecha shalom. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee his shalom. Where we say Shabbat Shalom to you, everyone. God bless you. Until the next time. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. God bless you.